I thought what I would do is talk a little bit about my own experiences and my background leading into South Burlington, um, partly because I'm on a panel with a bunch of other people who were there. So if I recount what went on, it was the same thing everybody else experienced. I thought I don't want to repeat what they have to say. I didn't realize I was going to be speaking early, see? So, uh, you know, I could use all their stories. But uh, <clears throat> um, really, um, I was an economics major as an undergraduate. I went to the University of Florida, graduated in 1972. So that was two years before the South Royalton Conference. Uh, and as an economics major, I had no clue that there was anything like the Austrian school. And not only the Austrian school, but um, any sort of intellectual foundation for, um, for free markets and, and liberty. Um, and. Um, I mean, I could, if I looked out in the real world, you know, I could see the problems with the centrally planned Cuban economy, and I could compare East Germany and West Germany, and it seemed like a kind of a practical thing to see how well markets worked. But uh, I had some, quote, intellectual friends as undergraduates, uh, and why I was thinking they were intellectual is they were taking all the honors courses, and they liked to read a lot, and that sort of thing. And they were all socialists. Uh, and their idea about contemporary economics, they picked up, well, John Kenneth Galbraith was uh, the leading guru of contemporary economics. <clears throat> Macroeconomics was all Keynesian macroeconomics and fine tuning the economy and that sort of thing. <clears throat> so my impression was that this idea of um, the efficacy of uh, free markets, uh, it was a practical kind of idea, but it was really anti-intellectual. The reason I thought that was all the intellectuals I knew were socialists. So when I got to graduate school, uh, that's when I found out about the Austrian school and uh, <clears throat> um, Mises, Payek, Rothbard, uh, and I found that out through my classmates. I didn't get any of that in, in class again, but uh, I was fortunate to have some classmates who had done a lot of reading and knew a lot about the Austrian school. Uh, and so, um, so I could uh, talk with them a little bit. I started doing some reading myself. Uh, and then I started getting uh, the laissez-faire book catalog, which People of my vintage will remember that, you know, uh, which is where I, you know, found out uh, other stuff to read, um, and it was it was just a revelation to me because I, I just had no idea that there was a well-established intellectual tradition supporting liberty, supporting free markets. I mean, this was was new to me. So I, so I started doing a lot of reading. And so in the next couple of years, by the time the South Royalton uh, Conference came around, um, I had read all this stuff. I'd read Hayek's, uh, uh, Hayek's work. I'd read Human Action. I'd read Rothbard. Uh, Kersner's Competition and Entrepreneurship was a, a new and exciting book. Uh, so in a couple of years, uh, I had uh, familiarized myself with that. And then when I found out about the South Royalton Conference, I thought, well, this sounds uh, uh, pretty interesting. Uh, so I'll uh, attend the, the conference. Um, uh, one uh, one uh, personal re recollection I have on that conference was uh, Walter Block was there, uh, and he had brought a chessboard, and not only a chessboard, but a chess clock. So I, was, I knew how to play chess, but I'd never played with a clock before, and Walter had pretty much mastered, you know, <laughs> uh, working the clock and keeping the time and everything. So I played chess with Walter a lot. I never won a single game. Um, uh, and another recollection I, I have of that uh, conference, I'm sure everybody else will remember this too, was uh, Larry Moss, who was an assistant professor at the University of Virginia at the time, uh, was a great magician. And, uh, so, and so he did a lot of magic tricks uh, uh, during the conference. He, he, one evening, he put on a, a whole magic show. It was really professional quality stuff. So it was really it was just fun to to see Larry do the magic and everything. And I sort of bugged him, uh, you know, show me a trick, you know, so show me how you do, do a trick. And you know, magicians never tell their tricks. But anyways, I thought I'd persuaded him. I went to, I said, okay, I'll show you a trick. So he pulls out this pocket knife and it's got a red handle on both sides. He shows me both sides, it's a red, red handle. Okay, and, and then with sleight of hand, I have no idea, sleight of hand, he turns it green. He shows me both sides, now it's green. And then he turns it red and turns it, how do you do that? Wow, that's incredible. So then, he's, now he's got two knives. 
He says, well, I've got this one's red, this one's green. And he shows me, oh, two knives. And then he turns them both red and he turns them both green. And uh, so, uh, uh, and I had heard, by the way, that he had, he had done some of these magic tricks for Ayn Rand, who hated them because, you know, she, you know, she, she had this idea, A is A, you know, and so, uh, so, uh, uh, so, so that was that was pretty entertaining. But uh, and I, um, uh, like Richard was saying, uh, it was quite a shock for me to, to meet Ray, Murray Rothbard. And I would, here I would just say the same thing that Richard said that I just I just pictured Murray to be this sour old man, you know, bitter at the the oppression of the state and so forth. And so you meet the guy and he's like Santa Claus, you know, he's just laughing and 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 really just had that magnetic personality. Uh, that uh, was, people would just gravitate to him. He had fascinating story after story. Uh, so it was really exciting to meet him. And if I think about the experience of, uh, of being at South Royalton, being at that, that conference, I had been introduced to these ideas and to the Austrian school uh, by my classmates. And we talked about this stuff among ourselves. We would also raise it in class. Uh, you know, uh, it was especially interesting to raise some of um, Hayek's ideas on the business cycle in macroeconomics classes and things, um, which would <clears throat> annoy my professors a little bit. Um, but it, but it seemed like you know here we were a, this little. Uh, niche like a few people who who knew this literature and so uh, you know one of the things uh, about South Royalton was the lectures the things that we heard from the leaders of the movement so I mean at the time uh, I think uh, Rothbard and Kersner would have been well the preeminent uh, uh, Austrians, and so to actually meet them and see them, that was great. Uh, the lectures, uh, in a way, I mean, if you look at the audience who was there, you look at the people who had uh, attended, and everybody already knew a lot about Austrian economics. So it wasn't a matter of introducing people to these new ideas or trying to persuade them about uh, the significance of the works of the Austrian school because the people who were there already knew uh, that literature. But what it did was to bring together a group of people who had these similar interests. So you could see, well, not only were you interested in these ideas, but there were people from all over the country, uh, a group of, of uh, young scholars. There were some, uh, some more senior people who were there. But th there was actually a group of people people that were, uh, you know, essentially the uh, contemporary Austrian school. I mean, the Austrian school had sort of faded by the wayside, and, and South Royalton Conference is talked about uh, as the beginning of the Austrian revival. Uh, and at least, uh, I think one of the big reasons why that's true is that there were people from all over the country, different schools, different places, who were familiar with these ideas, and to get everybody together, you could see, hey, here's a group that there actually is an Austrian school. Uh, and I think in hindsight, that's turned out to be the more significant part of the South Royalton Conference than the actual content uh, of the lectures. Uh, I mean, Murray's lectures were great, and he's such an entertaining speaker. I mean, it's if you didn't have a chance to hear him, you know, Murray was great. Um, uh, Israel was uh, was an interesting speaker. Uh, Lachman, I said, I could not understand anything he was talking about. <laughs> uh, and I said, I don't know, Ed, I don't know how much editing you did on that volume, uh, but, <laughs> but it actually, if you read the volume, you can follow the ideas, but I'm sitting there listening to them at the time as um, like incomprehensible. But so, so there's, so, but you had the lectures, you know, you were able to hear these people, but we were already, you know, familiar with those ideas. The people who were there already knew those ideas. And, and the big impact in hindsight, I think, was that 
we discovered there's a nucleus of people here who are interested in these ideas who want to develop these ideas. And if you look at the list of people who were there and you think about where the Austrian school has come over the last 40 years, I mean, you see that, um, uh, you know, maybe we can attribute some of that to that that conference, but um, I mean, you look at uh, it, uh, people like Joe, you know, so may at the conference that might have been something that kept you in the Austrian school, and so you're here today. Uh, you look at the Austrian program uh, up at George Mason University that was started by Don Lavoy, uh, uh, Jack High, Karen Vaughn. They were all there. Um, you look at uh, the Austrian program at New York University, not quite as strong as it used to be, but you know Israel uh, 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 was there, uh, Mario Rizzo was there. So you, you look at the development of the Austrian school, and I think one of the, the really significant things about that conference over and above the content of what was there was that it gathered together a group of people where we could see there's a group of us who have common interests, and so that laid the foundation for the development of the Austrian school over the next 40 years. And so you look at the people who were there, uh, and I say, I guess I was one of the young people <laughs> there at the time, uh, but, the, uh, but, but uh, the people who were there, and then their students and their students, that's what's made the Austrian school what it is today. So I think the real significance of that conference was the fact that it actually got all those people together in one place so we could see here's the potential for the Austrian school. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>